Hey, g'day, it's Brezzo. Welcome back to the Mixi Chronicles. Now this is part 11 on building a Mixi clock. Now what's a Mixi clock you ask? Well, it's a backlit digital clock built in a steampunk style. And this is the, hopefully the last video in the series. And what I'm going to do today is to put together all of these parts and this hardware and try and get a working clock out of this. So what we're going to do today is to look at not all of the assembly because honestly a lot of it's boring and I'm just going to show you the camera worthy parts <laughs> and uh, some of the more interesting pieces and assemblies that go into this. I'm also going to reveal the mystery feature, this little uh, feature in here and at the end of the video you're going to see what that's all about. Now I left some hints in the last video and some people responded in the comments and said they knew what it was all about. Some people got really, really close, but I don't think anybody's quite nailed it yet, but I haven't checked the comments in the last two or three days. Now, speaking of comments, uh, YouTube has screwed up somewhere along the line, and while I normally see all of the comments for all of my videos on a particular part of the YouTube channel, uh, in this case, I was going through and answering some comments, and I started to see some that were two or three months old, and a lot of them and there was a little banner at the top of the screen that said something about uh, YouTube had responded to an issue which is usually code for we screwed up somehow and it appeared that there were a whole bunch of comments there which I had never seen. Now I normally try to answer all of the comments that come in for any new videos that are put up and I often see uh, comments for older videos as well and I answer those. But if you left a comment and I didn't respond it's probably because I didn't see it. And I started to go through and answer those older comments, but I realized it would have seemed a bit weird. Uh, somebody may have left a comment, got no response, and all of a sudden, three months later, I start responding to it. So if you're in that category, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, I just probably didn't see it. But uh, what we're gonna do now is get on and let's, uh, let's put this stuff together and get a finished clock, and then we're gonna see it running. Now that I've got all these parts clean, the next question is how do you protect them? Now, if I do nothing, this metal will oxidize and with brass it goes sort of a pale brown, the copper will go a dull brown. And the only way to prevent that from happening is to put some sort of barrier between the clean surface of the metal and the oxygen in the air. Now there are some commercially available products, I mean Incrilac is one that's uh, promoted quite often for keeping brass and copper clean and it's all right it lasts for about six to twelve months but the problem is that when you spray the metal if there are any air bubbles at all that will leave that section of the material exposed to the oxygen it will start to oxidize in that tiny little spot and then will start to travel under the paint and what you'll end up with is like long veins of oxidized material going under the paint in extreme cases the paint will start to lift and the only way to fix that then is to remove all of the paint and then start again. And that means using some sort of a solvent. And if this clock is all assembled and given how intricate it is, that would be a nightmare. So what I'm doing is I'm using a wax. Now this is Canuba wax with a small amount of beeswax in it. And this won't prevent the oxidizing. It'll delay it, slow it down, but it's still going to happen. But the good thing is that you can get the wax off very easily just using mineral spirits or turpentine and then you know you can start again but really uh, this clock is going to <laughs> it's not going to be like a pristine piece of polished artwork uh, it does need to look weathered and old so if it does oxidize it's not a big deal but I hate the look of material that's been painted with something when the paints failed uh, it's better to just let it oxidize naturally in some cases. So I'm just putting this wax on and wiping most of it off. Uh, this technique is often used by clockmakers on any exposed uh, bright work on clocks. 
uh, but I also use lacquer. But I think this, in this case, because of the you know, the nature of this particular clock, I think that um, I think the wax is the way to go. So I'm going to do all of these parts and then put them aside, try and keep them clean, and then we'll start the assembly of the, the finished article. I've got to be able to fit this light dependent resistor into this acrylic lens here and I could use cyanoacrylate or like a hot glue or even epoxy but I want that to look really clear through the end of the lens there. Now some time ago I bought some of this UV curing resin and I tried out a few projects, it didn't really work for what I was doing but I think for this it's going to be fine because it sort of sets with a like a smeary coating on it, but because it's going to be underneath the lens, it won't matter. So I'll give it a try. So I'm just going to squeeze a bit of that resin into that hole there. And this is going to bond it, but leave it nice and clear looking. So I'm just going to sort of squish that in there. So it goes under the resin. Okay, we'll turn our light on. I think that's started to set already. Let's see what it looks like from the end. And when you look at it from the end, it's really, really clear. I think that's going to be fine. But I'll let that uh, cure a bit more. Well, that's sort of well and truly set now. There it is in the, the brass base, and like I say, when you look at that through the end there, you can see the LDR quite clearly. There's two wires coming from the LDR, they'll go down into the body of the clock to connect to the node MCU. Also needs a resistor added into one of these wires here, but we'll fix it up later. hate doing this. There was a time when I was a younger man <laughs> and I had nimble fingers so I could do this easily. Thank heavens for nut drivers. a child to do this for me. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Alright, that doesn't need to be super tight, but there's our little LDR showing through the window there. And this all needs a lining later on and we need to get our LED fitted into this little cup here for the discombobulator. This is a single LED that needs to fit through the base of this discombobulator and unfortunately the copper tubing that connects it to the rest of the clock is a really tight fit so I've had to split one of the wires off the, the strand of three so that when it fits through the copper tube it's more like a triangular configuration rather than a flat ribbon and it just fits Let's sort of jiggle it around to get it started Is going to have to bunch up in there a bit, but that fits. All right, so that whole assembly is now ready to go on the clock, and these wires will go down and be connected to the node MCU.
Now, this is the heart of the whole clock. Now, this thing is called a Node MCU. Uh, it also goes by the name ESP8266. It's a Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller. And I, I'm not sure, but I believe that this is uh, like a variant of the ESP8266. Now, these are dirt cheap on eBay. You know, they cost about $13 or $14 or something. And I'm absolutely staggered by what they can do or what you can get them to do. And uh, when I made my Vixie clock, this is the controller that I used, and it works on the same principle. It connects to the home Wi-Fi and it gets the time from a time server. And then this also does all of the functions to actually set the clock, set the, the parameters of the clock, and also work with the display in the clock. And this is simply mounted on a laser cut acrylic platform. It's sitting on standoffs and this will be wired up independently of the clock and then right at the last minute we'll stuff everything in the back of the clock. Now this is the MP3 player which uh, as you see is what makes the sounds for the chime in the clock. Now this is made by a company called DF Robot and it can be operated as a standalone MP3 player and it can have uh, switches attached to it and you can shuffle through songs the songs or the sound files are actually stored on this device here. So there's some um, built-in storage. There's a USB-C port, which allows you to load the files onto the storage. And there's pins here which connect to either an amplifier or speakers. It's a, a stereo speaker setup, although I'm only using one speaker in the clock. And it can take the same power that the Node MCU takes. So I can wire these pins directly to the Node MCU and then there'll be a pair of wires going out to the speaker to finish the setup. Now this works great uh, and I learned the hard way that lesson. What's that lesson again? Oh yeah, buy once, cry once. <laughs> and as it turned out, I bought or I started using this little gadget here. Now this is just called a DF player. Now you can buy these also on eBay. I actually bought four of them. I killed one by wiring it up the wrong way. But this one doesn't have any onboard storage. You've got to put an SD card into that slot there. And although it does a similar job to the DF robot uh, device, this one, it does it really badly. Now, uh, when Mitch Markin and I were working on this project, he also bought two of these and tried and failed to make them work. I also tried and failed. The problem with these is that they're just a bit flaky and a bit dodgy. When you power this one up for the first time, it makes this horrible clicking sound. It clipped some of the sound files and wouldn't play them fully. It wouldn't work with the serial communication to uh, connect it to the Node MCU. And although I could get it to sort of work, it never really did the job. And I'm, you know, a bit disappointed really. But this one, the DF Robot one, fantastic. I've got no regrets about that one at all. So what am I going to do with this now? I've got three of them that work. Uh, I don't know. Let's teach it a lesson. That's right. Die in hardware hell, you useless piece of stuff. Oh man, it really made a mess. <laughs> well, you clean it up, Mark. Now, things I do for YouTube. I have to fit 36 of these little tiny 7BA nuts and bolts into these flanges. And they're just decorative, but when I bought these, I got them with a smaller than standard hex size, just so they would fit these flanges a bit easier. But they are an absolute nightmare to manipulate and get the, the nuts started. And I have got these little nut drivers for BA size screws and nuts and bolts and so on. But because these are non-standard size, the 7BA is too big and the 8BA is too small. But I can just get enough purchase on that to get it spinning. And they don't need to be very tight. 
And some people look at a job like this and say, well, Mark, it's character forming and it's, um, it's challenging. <laughs> but for me, it's just soul destroying. Anyway, mustn't grumble, I'll get the rest of these in. There you go, two down, four to go. Got that power socket screwed in place now, and here's my two wires coming from the 5 volt power supply, and these will go up to the, the main body of the clock. So we're just going to run these through a bit of conduit. So this will double back on itself and go in through the back panel of the clock. Now our copper arms can go in place. And this centerpiece of copper is just loose. There's really no need to fix that. And that way you can sort of slide it until it fits the two holes in the base. Those are basically just a press fit in there. So we've got a little bit of adjustment we can make uh, lifting this up or down. If necessary, I'll just lock that in place with some Loctite. But there's the bottom half of the clock done. So let's turn our attention to the uh, case, the wooden case. We used to have a really nice long Stanley screwdriver which was ideal for this sort of work but I lost it. <laughs> I probably left it up in a ceiling somewhere. This little short one is quite hard to use compared to the, a longer screwdriver. And the problem with driving slotted screws is that if the screwdriver slips, you're going to gouge something, either your hand or the work. Alright, so I'm going to get the other one on. These won't come off now, they're going in place permanently. The sandblasted acrylic screen is going to go in to the pocket. It's held in place with two little countersunk head screws at either end, or one at either end. And then the Stainless steel mesh will go over the top of that. So in order to get this mesh to sit flat, I'm going to have to fit a couple of screws here to hold that down to the acrylic. Now I've made a CAD drawing which came from the CAD model which shows the position of the digital display behind the screen. And I've drawn a centre line through that and I can put the mesh over the top of that and I'm going to drill a hole at either end but I need to be able to be sure I'm going to miss the digital display that's why I've got that drawing there. So I'm going to put a screw just close to the outer edge of each of the end digits and I'm using a uh, 10BA round head screw. 10BA is really really small <laughs> and uh, I'm going to put one there Unfortunately, there's a wire right on the center line. Uh, typical. <laughs> but oh, I got close. That one's probably a little bit off. This one's probably a little bit under. But we'll just get a thread on those now and then we can fit the screen temporarily. It's all going to come out again. So that drill bit I used there was 66 thou. Just give you some idea of how small this tap is. I might have messed up there a bit, I think I'm a bit close to this screw or a bit far away from that one. But they're so small, I don't think you're going to notice. Now 
That's what a 10BA screw looks like. Now let's put this in temporarily, it's all going to come out again. And when I get the other one in, that'll hold that mesh you know, reasonably flat. If necessary, I'll put some double sided tape under that, but hoping it won't be necessary. Now you're probably wondering about this little part here because I didn't show this in any of the earlier videos and once I decided I was putting this loudspeaker in the clock I had to figure out a way of covering that up and I did have some more stainless steel mesh, I had some aluminium mesh but none of it looked right, it looked unfinished around the edge so I thought it needed to have sort of a frame around it but I ended up machining this from a single piece of 2mm thick brass stock on the CNC milling machine so the internal pocket there was milled out. I used a 6mm end mill and then finish up with a 4mm to do the corners. Everything was drilled on the CNC and I uh, then heated this up with a gas flame to anneal it so it was soft and I bent it with the jeweler's rolls to match the curvature of the frame. And then I used a process where I polished the brass and then heated that up with a ga gas flame and what that does is it changes the colour of the brass and gives it this beautiful golden sheen and in the centre I heated it even more and it went a sort of a purpley blue colour but then I powder coated it with a clear powder coat and all of that colour disappeared which was disappointing but at least this is going to stay relatively shiny and it's a complex part so that's the only part that I've clear powder coated on the clock This uh, copper coil has just been super glued into the acrylic base inside the discombobulator and of course the LED shines up through that copper coil there. Now when I tried this out for the first time I was a bit disappointed with the amount of light that was being projected up through the copper coil there. And although you could see it, if you looked in the base, it just didn't appear up the centre of the copper coil there. So what I made is a laser cut acrylic uh, rod, I guess, it's square in section and it's got a sort of a scallop shape engraved in the back of it there and when the LED illuminates this from underneath each of those little scallops there appears to be lit up although they get uh, darker as they get toward the top and that just fits down through the center of the coil and rests on top of the LED and uh, you'll see that in a minute and in order to fit this uh, glass tube over that, I'm going to use some just ordinary window silicon, just a very small amount to anchor that into this brass cup here. And that way, if I need to remove it, I can get it out without breaking the glass. I guess the hard part here is getting this stuff in without smearing it everywhere. So I'm just going to put a bit at the back and a little bit at the front. Doesn't need a lot. Uh, can I fit that in there? I'll get it in there, I think. So I've got that in two spots. And I'll just rotate that a bit to smear it. But I think that's going to hold. And like I say, if I never, ever need to get that out, I can just sort of twist it and break the bond and take it out that way. Now, I know this looks like a mess and it is a bit of a mess, but cable management is not one of my fortes. But I've tested everything and I've ch double checked the wiring diagram. Now, 
I made this wiring diagram and modified it as we added more features to the clock. And here's the MP3 player here, here's the speaker. This is the light dependent resistor that sets the clock to the night mode. Here's the three buttons which control the menu on the back of the clock. And another feature that was added was to feed the data line for these LEDs from 5 volts. Now that needs a diode, a couple of resistors, uh, tapped from the, the 5 volts coming from the power supply. And that uh, powers all of the LEDs with a total of 5 volts on the pins. And given that there are a lot of LEDs, they prefer to run in that higher voltage. So I have, like I say, tested it, um, and this little 3D printed tray has been glued into the bottom of the clock here, and then we can just simply spin that whole assembly of components around and drop them into the tray, and that makes the USB port for the microcontroller accessible from the back of the clock, and you can plug it in without sort of moving this backwards and forwards, otherwise it's, it's really awkward to screw it down inside this narrow space here. So let me stuff all the innards in there and then we'll uh, spin it around and see it running and hear it running. Well, I'm guessing you're wondering what this is all about, so let me explain. All right, so what's the sticker about? Well, I'd love to say that this is entirely my own work, but it's not. I actually had a lot of help with this project. And the three flags on the back here represent me. That's me in the middle, the Australian flag. And the other two flags belong to three gentlemen. Now, the first one is Leon van der Bugel. Now, he came up with the original design for a backlit digital clock, which I modified and changed to make into a clock, which I called a Vixie clock. Here's a picture of it here. And I love that clock, it's absolutely fantastic. I love the way the display appears on what looks like just a piece of wood. And when, uh, when Leon made that available, he made it completely open source and uh, I was very grateful to get the design concept and the design methodology and make it work for me. So that's, that's what the flag of the Netherlands is all about. So what about the Canadian flag? Well, that uh, is to represent two other people who helped me a great deal with this project. Now, the first one is Eric Van Andel. Now, Eric has an Instagram account, and he posted some pictures of some backlit digital clocks similar to my Vixie clock, and we got chatting about uh, the design, and he sort of threw up the idea of, uh, you know, can we make it uh, play a chime or play an alarm sound? And at the time, I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's have a go not realizing how complicated it was going to be. Now, Eric knows a lot more about uh, code than I do. Uh, he's made a electronic lead screw for a lathe that he owns, and uh, he struggled with that and got it working. And he reached out and said, I'll send you some code which might prove that these little uh, MP3 players will work in the application that you want. Now, he did that. Uh, we had about four or five goes at getting it to work got close, but eventually we both hit a, a bit of a brick wall. And then I decided to reach out to this other gentleman here named uh, Mitch Markin. Now Mitch is a real guru when it comes to coding. He's helped me with a number of clocks that I built and he sent me code and kept improving the code and kept adding new features to it. And I reluctantly asked him <laughs> if he could give me a hand with this project here. And there was no question. He said, yep, let's do it and he started sending me code without having any of the hardware. Now, having the hardware is important because you can test the code out straight away, you can find the bugs and fix them. Now, what he did instead was send me the code, I tried it out at this end, and if it didn't work, I'd tell him what the problem was, he'd sort of write new code, and eventually we got the whole thing to work perfectly. And uh, I was very, very happy to report back to Mitch that I had it working, and he wants to incorporate the same uh, technology into some clocks that he already owns. And here's some still images of some of Mitch's clocks because they're absolutely out outstanding. So I must thank all three of these gentlemen. Uh, all three of them have contributed in some way to this project and that's why their names are on the back and that's why you see the flag. Now there is another connection with Canada and that's to do with the legendary singer-songwriter Neil Young. 
Now, he released an album back in the, I think it was the late 80s. It was called Reactor. And there's a song in that album called Southern Pacific. Now, I bought the album many years ago, and the first time I played that track, it really stood out to me. And it's the opening of the song that I've sampled to turn into the chime for this clock. Now, I can't play the track for you because I get into trouble with copyright, but you can search for it on YouTube. Just look for Reactor by Neil Young and the song Southern Pacific. And uh, you'll be able to hear the whole thing and you'll be able to recognise the bits that I've chopped up to make the chime. So let's spin this thing around. Let's kick it in the guts and see what it sounds like. Oh, and I'm going to show you how the menu system works too. And that's what these buttons are all about. Okay, let's boot it up. Music. Now it does that every time and I can't stop it. Sounds horrible. <laughs> okay, here we are here. So this is the version number. It's looking for Wi-Fi. Uh, next thing it does, it shows the universal time code. So this is 20 hours offset. It's found the Wi-Fi and now we get the normal time display. Now with the buttons on the back of the clock, there's one that allows you to show minutes and seconds. That's the date, actually. So another press takes you to the date. This one should be minutes and seconds. No, it's not. There it is there. So that's minutes and seconds. Let's get back to time. That's date. Now we're back to time. Okay, now with the menu, Mitch has very kindly supplied a cheat sheet. It's about five pages long. And that's to explain the 20 different menu items and the choices that you have. And the way we step through the menu is by pressing either the plus or the minus button on the back of the clock. And then you need to look at what the choices are and set them with either a long press or a short press on the buttons. So let's try this out. Okay, so the first one is setting the hour format. You can set it to 12 hour or 24 hour. This one here is the, what is that? Zero, uh, leading zero blanking. So this will uh, turn off the leading zero if that's what you want. Okay, this one, DF, is date format. So this is um, the day, then the month. But you can flip that. You can have it the other way around if you want to. Okay, ADAU is automatic date display and so on. So there's a whole bunch of different options. I won't run you through them all, it just takes too long. But if you do nothing, it will go back to the normal time display. So there it is there. So that part of it works brilliantly. And I've got this clock set up the way that I want it now. I'm quite happy with it. But remember, you can change things if you wish. Okay, now I guess the thing you really want to know is what does the chime sound like? So let's have a look at that. Now I recorded this earlier in the day so the time won't be correct, but you get the idea. So let's listen to it at a quarter past the hour. And here's half past the hour. Here it is at a quarter to three. And here it is now, this is the hourly chime. Well, you just heard the complete range of sounds that the clock makes, except that the hourly chime will increment along with the display. Now, there is a section in the code that turns the chime off at 10 o'clock in the evening, turns it back on again at 8 a.m. And, of course, you can play around with the code to change those hours if you wish, but it just simply mutes the chime during that time. Now, there's one more thing I want to add to the clock before we wind up today's episode, so let me get that ready and we'll do the reveal. Well, as you can see, they're both finished. They're both running well. I'm super happy with the way these have turned out. And I've now got to get one of these packaged up and sent off to my young nephew. Other one's going up in the house. So forget about your Nixie clocks, your Lixie clocks, your Vixie clocks, your Art Deco clocks, your Silly Walks clocks. This has become my new favorite clock. And I'm going to finish up the episode and in fact the series right now and when we come back in the next video, I'm going to be doing something completely different. Trust me, really different. So tune in for that. And we've also got the 15,000 subscriber draw coming up soon. So if you're not a subscriber yet, do it. So it's Prezo signing out for now. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you on the next video. And have a nice day.